proud Michigan city, once the epicenter of America's car industry, now more famous for its crime rate. The city of Flint has been known as one of the most violent cities in America for its size. Historically in the top three per capita in terms of violence. So we're used to shootings and we're used to assaults because we have way too many of them. 2010 was a record-breaking year. We had 66 homicides in the city of Flint alone. And it was just the beginning of what we were about to see. In the stillness of the early morning in a desolate part of town, an unusual heap of what looks like trash on the sidewalk catches the eye of a Flint police officer. And he pulls up next to two other patrol officers, also on third shift, and he says, you know, I think I saw a pile of clothes back there on Saginaw Street, but I'm not sure. So why don't you guys follow me back there? I think I ought to check it out. What, at first glance, looks like a pile of old clothes, turns out to be something far more disturbing. It was a man who had been viciously stabbed, lying in a pool of blood. The victim is barely breathing and losing blood quickly. Just as he's about to lose consciousness, he mutters a few crucial words. Authorities quickly determine that this attack was not likely a mugging when they discover the victim's wallet and cash untouched in his pants pocket. It was later determined that the person who was lying in the road who had been stabbed was Arnold Miner. He was then put in the ambulance, an officer went with him. He died in the ambulance. Investigators immediately canvassed the area around the crime scene for suspects and witnesses. Where this happened was what would during the day be a busy stretch of street, but no one would have been there. I mean, unless someone was walking by themselves at 2.30 in the morning. Later that morning, police deliver the tragic news to Miner's sister and mother. They share a photo of him in happier days. He's in this white shirt and this tie, and it looks like he's got some sort of ID badge on and just smiling with these glasses, and he's sort of just this thin, kind of frail, short guy with this great smile. And you could tell by talking with his family that they just really loved him. Police are baffled. Their investigation reveals Arnold to be an upstanding citizen with no enemies. What was it about Arnold Miner that made him a target? He was a pretty nondescript guy, but a gentle soul and certainly didn't deserve what happened to him. 5'6", five, 5'7", five, something like that, thin, frail. If you were looking for someone who you wouldn't want to fight back or wouldn't expect to fight back, this was it. This would be their ideal victim. At that point, we didn't have a lot to go on. Somebody had been stabbed. We knew he was alone, walking on the streets of Flint. That's pretty much all we knew. Then a hot lead turns up right across the street from where Miner was stabbed to death. We were able to get video footage from a party store that was located maybe 100 yards uh, south of the scene of the Arnold Miner stabbing. It looked like an SUV driving by one way, and I believe it came back the other way. It was a suspiciously quick change of direction. Armed with this vital clue, police spend hours pouring through their records. Arnold Miner's attack seems to fit into an emerging pattern of stabbings that has been escalating over the past week. Black men being accosted on the streets of Flint in the middle of the night while they were alone walking. We started thinking maybe we have the same perpetrator of all these crimes. Detectives turn back the clock. Three months earlier, 31-year-old David Motley is stabbed to death. At the time, it was wrongly chalked up to gang violence. Then, a month later, another victim. 
The second homicide was not discovered until, I believe, June 21st. Now, that's nearly a month apart. And there was no investigative connection made then. The unfortunate second victim turned out to be 59-year-old Emmanuel Dent, whose life was cut short after multiple stab wounds caused him to bleed to death. Gun violence is almost 100% of the crime that we see in, in, in Flint. We don't see a lot of stabbings, and as we started to see more, those certainly stuck out. Over the series of the next few weeks, there began to be one assault after another. And beginning on July 26th, July 27th, 28th, and 29th, there was one each day. Some of these individuals were lifted up off the ground as the knife protruded up towards the chest cavity. Whoever was doing it had to be pretty strong because in order to stick that knife in and then yank it up and really cut out the guts of the individual, it's not that easy to do that. There's a lot of, a lot of torque involved. Six men stabbed, three dead. Police now believe an elusive monster is on the loose, attacking victims at random without leaving a trace of evidence. Then, on July 30th, officers find 60-year-old Frank Killebrew's body lying in a parking lot. The stab wounds on his body, just one part of a now familiar M.O. He wasn't even robbed. He had two wallets on him. So it's another very violent attack on somebody who wasn't robbed, walking down the street alone at night. That was that watershed moment where the investigators at the crime scene, they were looking at this and they're going, hey, wait a minute. We've had a bunch of these things. And that's when the investigative connection was made. By the time Arnold Miner was stabbed to death on August 2nd, there had been a stabbing in Flint every night for the previous week. These were savage attacks. There's just no way else to describe it. These were savage, brutal, violent attacks. This guy's not stopping. This guy, he's on a rampage. As the number of attacks rises to 12, panic sweeps across the city. What we saw in the next week was something I haven't seen since. People genuinely concerned. And you're talking about a city that's used to crime, that's used to being on edge. People were afraid of becoming the next victim. So the best way to avoid that was don't go out at night. The community was up in arms, they wanted action, and the police agencies and the law enforcement folks wanted to make something happen. The problem that we were having is that the police agencies weren't really communicating with one another because we were having a series of these stabbings, but they all weren't occurring in the same jurisdiction. The nature and the magnitude of this investigation was going to be beyond the scope of the Flint Police Department to investigate all these homicides right now. And that's when the request was made. McGreevy and his team call in reinforcements to form the Serial Stabber Task Force. We had police officers from seven different jurisdictions, and we all wanted to capture this individual. But even with so many new players in the investigation, the task force doesn't make much headway. People were just kind of grasping at straws, if you will, because nobody really had any suspects. Right now, all police know is that their perp is white, strong, drives an SUV, and prefers a knife. He seems to attack black men at night, and he is terrifyingly prolific. We couldn't have any more homicides. It just wasn't in the equation. Absolutely not. But to do that, police need a solid lead. And they need it fast before the serial slasher strikes again. This guy's not stopping. We have a madman on the loose. A cold-blooded killer has randomly stabbed 14 people in Flint, Michigan in two months, and there's almost no evidence to go on. Then, the cops catch a huge break when one of the slasher's most recent victims is able to speak to them from his hospital bed. 
17-year-old Etwan Wilson is a good-natured kid, originally from the rough neighborhoods of East Detroit. He was sent to Flint with his mother, hoping that this town would prove safer than the last. Not only for him, but also for his son. On the evening of August 1st, 2010, Etwan is walking home alone after a party just a few blocks from his house when he notices a man standing next to an SUV. He was on the phone and I can hear him say, man, you got me lost, you got me lost, I don't see it. I had to go like past him to get to where I was going. So as I was walking closer, he said, excuse me, do you know where Clio Road is? I was like, man, what is you doing? And as I pushed him, that's when I felt the knife come out of him. And I just, when I seen the blood, I just took off running. I turned around and I looked back. And he was just standing there, staring at me. And there I was like, man, this dude crazy. Fighting through the pain, Etwan stumbles to the first house he sees with a light on. As he lies on the stranger's floor, Etwan thinks these moments will be his last. I'm like, I'm getting sleepy. And that's when she started crying. And she was like, no, don't go to sleep, don't go to sleep. And she grabbed the cold water and she was like, you know, splashing it on my face, man. That was like giving me a lot of energy, you know, to, to stay woke, to stay alive. And the lady, Regina, she was stressing to me, like, you're not gonna die, you're not gonna die. Barely breathing, one thought keeps going through his mind. I remember saying, like, I don't wanna die here without my son. Like, I wanna see my son again. And, and, but blood is pouring out of his wounds, spreading across the floor. I remember the ambulance coming in, and I heard him say, oh, he's stabbed in the lungs. We gotta hurry up. And I just remember passing out. I remember waking up, seeing my daddy sitting next to me. And at, at first, it kind of scared me because I'm like, this just happened at three o'clock this morning and you stay way in Detroit. How did you get here? Not knowing that this was this happened two days ago. With 40 staples holding his wounds together, Etwan is lucky to be alive. The knife just missed puncturing his heart, but the damage to his chest and abdomen require a long and painful recovery. Now, four days after the attack, Etwan is well enough to talk, and he gives them exactly what they need, a detailed description of the attacker. He was big, like a UFC fighter, like he cage fired or something. Couldn't really see his face. As he had his cap pulled all the way, it, he had it bent at the top, and it was a dark night, so. The way she drew the eyes was like kind of perfect. Authorities release an official statement to the public, along with the sketch. The stabber is a monster of a man, six foot five, 280 pounds. Also described as a wide-jawed white man. That sketch got so much play in, in the papers, online, on television, posters. People now just had this image ingrained in them. And I think this really helped the community understand that, wow, they're making some progress. The climate in the city of Flint was palpable. People were in fear. They had a madman running around and preying on these victims. We had to get this guy. A white male and all 14 of his victims, African-American. There was a notion that there were maybe some racial implications. You know, from an outsider looking at it, it would seem that this was a race issue and that he was going after black men. But if you know the demographics of the city, the person that's gonna be walking by themselves at that time of the day or at that time of the night is going to be a black male just because 
of the city we live in. That's the majority of, of the population. You know, I don't really know why he was stabbing black people, but he didn't say anything racial when he stabbed me. Police have no idea whether the slasher is motivated by bigotry or just a lust for killing. But as more recovering survivors are able to speak, investigators find they're all telling the same story. He would drive the streets of Flint. He'd see a, an African-American male walking along a sidewalk. He'd pull up. He'd say, hey, buddy, uh, can you tell me how to get to such and such a place? Hey, hey, do you know anything about fixing a car? I got a problem here. Can you come closer? And that's when you catch what occurred. Police believe the slasher makes an effort to hide his powerful size to his victims as he lures them in. Well, it's nighttime, and the street lights don't work so well, and, and he may not appear quite as large as he ultimately turns out to be. And I think he used that to his advantage, and he wasn't as ominous looking until they got up close and that knife came out. They would come to his rescue because they're good, kind-hearted people, and then he would take advantage and attack them. That's a pretty low thing to do. After five days without any significant progress, frustrated investigators reach out to the community for help by setting up a 24-hour tip line. And the phone was literally, I'm told, ringing off the hook constantly with concerned citizens offering tips. Thousands of tips are pouring in and thousands of leads for police to tirelessly follow up. It was pure adrenaline. They'd work to the point of exhaustion. They'd lay down on the floor in their office and they'd get some sleep. Just didn't think about it. Just kept on moving. This was a you shall not fail mission. It was a chase. We just had to keep on going. I don't think I've ever seen such a dedicated group before on any case that I've been involved with. Yeah, you don't know what it's like when you go out in the street. In the grip of terror, Flint, Michigan holds its breath hour by hour, waiting for news of another stabbing. You don't know what's going on. My daughter won't even leave the house. I'm scared. But to everyone's surprise, three days pass without a new attack. And each day, it's like we were kind of almost in a sense waiting. Is this guy taking a break? Is he taking some time off? Or are we going to see another run? It won't be long before investigators get their answer. The guy said, we've just had three assaults identical to what you had up in front. We were stunned. Authorities in Michigan have finally secured a solid description of the man they're calling, the Flint Serial Slasher. But they have no DNA or other forensic evidence to link these unrelated attacks. And now, their target seems to have vanished. Is his killing spree over, or has he simply gone somewhere else in search of prey? To answer that, police send out bulletins across the country. And we're, here you go. Here's what we have. If any of you have anything similar to what we have here in Flint, give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. Three days later and 600 miles away, the Slasher Task Force is contacted by the tiny police department of Leesburg, Virginia, about a recent attack. The victim was walking across a parking lot when a vehicle pulled up to him and asked if he could assist him with some problems with his car. He sensed movement in his peripheral vision and saw the suspect swinging a hammer at him. And so he was able to partially deflect, pull away, so there was not a um, full contact. Um, the suspect then continued toward him and the victim was able to run away from him. It's the third hammer attack Leesburg police have seen in four days. Unusual for a town of 42,000 and almost no violent crime. Thankfully, none of the victims were killed. This number of violent attacks 
in this time period and just unheard of in our community. The third one just added more confirmation to our suspicions that we did have a serial attacker. For this third assault, the attacker had picked the worst possible location and investigators pick up a vital clue. The shopping area where it occurred had recently installed a new video surveillance system. And so we were able to get a, a picture of the actual vehicle. The vehicle is identified as an older model Trailblazer SUV. It looked to be dark green on the top with a lighter color uh, on the bottom panels of the vehicle. Authorities assume the car is from another state and scour motel parking lots looking for a green and tan SUV with out-of-state plates. But they come up empty-handed. Armed with the make, model, and color of the car, Leesburg police put out an all-points bulletin for it and any similar attacks. What initially was locally focused for similar cases expanded to regional and ultimately national. They come across bulletins from Flint about the recent serial slasher attacks and contact police in Michigan. The guy on the other end said, we've just had three assaults identical to what you had up in Flint. We were stunned. His weapon of choice may have changed from a knife to a hammer, but everything else about these attacks is the same. Police are convinced it's all the bloody handiwork of the serial slasher. And now the Flint task force has something they didn't have before, an accurate description of the SUV. And they said, oh yeah, by the way, the blazer we have down here, there's a couple of dents in the hood. We didn't have his face yet, but we now confirmed that it was the green over beige. Chevy Trailblazer. The media gets wind that Flint Slasher has now gone national, and the story explodes overnight, sparking coast to coast panic. So this drew a lot of national attention. So it made sense that CNN, ABC, NBC, CBS, uh, international media were all over this. And the sat truck started rolling in. And then everyone's worst nightmare comes true. Two days later, and 450 miles from Virginia, another horrific attack. Toledo, Ohio, police department calls up, says, not so fast. We have an attack down here, identical to what Leesburg has had and to what you've had. It's like, oh, this thing is, where's it gonna go next? Outside a picturesque church in the metropolitan town of Toledo, Ohio, the church custodian takes a well-deserved break. A hulking man steps out of a green SUV. He asks the custodian for directions. Harmless enough, until. One Toledo called, and it was like, you've gotta be kidding me. The green over bold, laser had been involved, African-American men had been stabbed, very violent stabbing. We thought that we had something very similar going on. With the Flint serial slasher's crimes confirmed to be crossing state lines, the FBI jumps in to join a team that's working 24-7. We have a madman on the loose. We have to stop this guy. Where's this guy gonna go next? What are we gonna have to do to stop him? Police still have an ID the suspect, but they'll soon get some help from another one of his victims. 26-year-old Flint resident Antoine Marshall, who was stabbed 14 days earlier, has been in a hospital ICU fighting for his life. Due to the nature of his injuries, you know, they bundled him up and got him to the hospital, but uh, he went right into surgery, so they didn't get a chance to interview him. But now, Antoine has recovered enough to give police a description of his attacker that will add two vital pieces of information to the puzzle. As he described the t-shirt that his assailant was wearing, and it was a specific brand of gym. He also clarifies the slasher's race. He 
was, I think, the first person who came out and said definitively, said, this guy isn't all white. He's mixed with something. He's got like olive skin. He's not all white. That was a fairly significant statement that he made. These two details will blow the case wide open. A new bulletin is sent across the country, refining the description of the slasher, in hopes this info would trigger someone's memory. And it pays off big time. Oh, baby. Tip 314. There's an unidentified female. And it's stated to the effect, I know a guy who works at a Kingswater Market up in Mount Morris. And, uh, oh, by the way, he went to Virginia last week to visit a relative. Hey, guys. How's it going? We got a disturbance call today. Do you notice that? But we now had somebody who matched the description, who had the right vehicle, who had some ties to Virginia. As investigators question the market's owner, a familiar logo catches the eye of one of the investigators. The t-shirt logo that was described uh, in the attack by Antoine Wilson. And they uh, were able to determine and confirm that the shirt the assailant was wearing was the same identical type of shirt that the store would have had. The pieces are all finally falling into place as police zero in on the serial slasher. But will they find him before he disappears for good? The Flint serial slasher has now jumped three states, randomly stabbing 18 victims without warning. Five men are dead, 13 have survived. It's a bloodbath that's causing widespread fear, hysteria, and disbelief across the nation. But a game-changing tip has led state troopers to a market where they believe the killer may have worked. Police know they've hit pay dirt when the owner immediately recognizes the man in the sketch. They learned that the individual worked there. He matched the description. They weren't sure of his full name. They only knew him as Eli. But they told us he was going off to Virginia and that indeed he had that kind of a vehicle that had been part of the bullet. The owner's information is sparse. Eli only worked for a short time on the night shift and the owner paid him in cash. But the most valuable information of all comes from the security cameras installed in the store. The store owner pointed out the employee who they were asking about who had left to go to Virginia and the store owner also on the archive video pointed out that person's vehicle which was parked in the parking lot. There you go. Appreciate it. Investigators are closer than they've ever been to learning the identity of the serial slasher. But they need a last name. The owner claims to know nothing else about Eli except that he's a good worker, speaks with an accent, and mostly keeps to himself. But in questioning other employees, the cops get one last clue from Eli's coworker. Getting his cell phone number was a critical piece of investigative evidence. One tip in a thousand has delivered a gold mine. Back at task force headquarters, state troopers share their exciting news with the team. At this point, the investigators had an exact match on the vehicle and the fact that this guy went to Leesburg, similar descriptions of the t-shirt, and now they had a cell phone number and we had a picture. So right now, things are beginning to move ahead just a little bit faster. They still don't have the suspect's last name. But in a stunning stroke of luck, the name of the market rings a bell for a member of the task force. And the one investigator goes, I remember that market. We did an alcohol enforcement sting a few weeks back. In fact, the guy you're talking about, the description, he matches the guy that we gave the ticket to. 
the Flint serial slasher is also guilty of selling alcohol to minors. And they actually had his driver's license, or at least a photocopy of it, because they had written him a ticket. And that's how we learned the real name of Eli was Elias Abulazar. Now that they have his full name, the task force goes into overdrive to track him down. By now, he'll know they're on to him thanks to the media attention. So he's no doubt laying low. Physically, no. We still didn't know where he was. It's like trying to find a needle in a haystack, in a sense, right? Where could he be? If his name and photo are released to the public, he could go underground and disappear for good. Unless they can find him first. Once we had his cell phone number, we were able to use it, really, to track him. Meanwhile, authorities dig into 33-year-old Elias Abulazam's past. The investigation determined that this individual was an Arab Christian born in Israel. His father died when he was young. During his teen years, he um, was sent to the United States to the Virginia area to live with family members. Late 2008, early 2009, had a uh, run-in with his brother-in-law that resulted in a physical altercation and then ended up going to the Flint, Michigan area and uh, living with relatives there. But what really caught everyone's attention was an incident in his country of birth. We learned that, in fact, in Israel, he had been involved in a stabbing. No charges were filed, but many who knew him could sense a deep-seated rage. It is a rage that victim Etwan Wilson knows all too well. 17 years old, my life was just changed. Just really went downhill. And it wasn't nobody fault but his, you know. It wasn't nothing that I, you know, something that I did that I made happen. But it's something that happened, you know, that couldn't have been avoided. At the task force, the cell phone tracking expert pings Abulazam's phone. When the computer reveals where that phone is, all systems go into immediate red alert. Guys, we got some bad news. Our suspect is on the move. It looks like the slasher is on the verge of escaping for good. They got it within a thousand yards of Louisville, Kentucky International Airport. Very close to the airport are two interstates. Is the guy flying or is he mobile? Is he driving? Their worst fears are confirmed when they check passenger lists for flights leaving the airport that night. And there he was, checked on a plane to fly to Tel Aviv. If he gets on that plane to Israel, we may never get him back. But to stop him, they not only have to secure a warrant, find him and arrest him, they also have to do it from 700 miles away in under an hour. The task force team has located the Flint serial slasher Elias Abulazan trying to flee the country. He's already boarded a flight in Louisville, Kentucky, bound for Israel. But fortunately, it has a stop over in Atlanta where he must change planes. This layover in Atlanta will be the task force's only chance to grab him. It's currently 9 p.m. in Flint. His flight to Israel will leave Atlanta at 10.15. If he's on the plane when it takes off, he could evade capture forever. Getting a person extradited from a foreign country is a very, very difficult thing to do. He couldn't get on the plane. Absolutely not. He could not leave the country. We had to stop that. With a little over an hour left, it's a race against time to catch this monster before he slips out of their grasp. But they can't just arrest him on the spot. We have to come up with a warrant. We have to come up with something to hold him. So there was a lot of pressure to get all of this together as quickly as possible. 
One of the hurdles was this was several states away for us, and we also knew that the Atlanta Hartsfield Airport was a huge international airport. We had to make contacts with the authorities down there and stress to them the urgency, the time constraints we had. But finding a judge to sign an arrest warrant at 9 o'clock at night is an arduous task. That involved getting him identified through the photo lineup, having a prosecuting attorney prepare that arrest warrant, having that arrest warrant signed by a judge to make it a valid arrest warrant, and then providing all of that information to the authorities in Atlanta. Navigating the legal loopholes in such a short time is difficult enough. But the team must also devise a way to apprehend a Bulazan without putting civilians around him at risk. And my number one concern was that if he gets on that plane, we have a hostage situation. He's going to know something's up, and he's going to put a knife or something to somebody's neck. Plus the fact that he's a huge guy. I mean, even without a weapon, he's dangerous. With just 45 minutes before the flight is scheduled to depart, there's still no sign of an arrest warrant, and more importantly, no sign of the man in question. We still hadn't physically spotted him yet. Waiting for the official go-ahead, a SWAT team in Atlanta moves into position. With precious minutes ticking away, the warrant finally comes through. Uh, I think we got him. And not a moment too soon, as Atlanta Airport Police spot a Bulazan amongst a sea of passengers, unaware of the danger they're now in. Back in Michigan, the task force can barely breathe as they wait for the news from Atlanta. We are aware he's at the gate, uh, ready to board the plane to Tel Aviv. We are aware that they're not going to let him get on, but we can't see any of this. We're just sort of hearing it from the other end of the telephone. We were closing this close, but it all had to happen absolutely perfect so nobody else got hurt with just moments left before boarding undercover squad team cops prepare to make their move their eyes trained on the target he's looking like he's going to get on that plane and things are going to be good and he's going to leave all these stabbings behind him and he's going to go back to his homeland authorities on the ground come up with a last minute idea to minimize the danger of those around the bullison An announcement is made over the public address system asking that Elias Abulazam please come up. And maybe Abulazam felt when he heard his name announced, this is great, they're going to upgrade me to first class because I'm a big guy and they realize that I need some extra room. And he's standing up. He's walking to the car. silence it seemed like an eternity and we're waiting we're holding our breath we're looking at the phone and we hear he's safely in custody oh my god you're under arrest for murder we got him man we got him we got him it's exactly what I felt. This is exactly what I did. We got him. Oh. When we finally get word that Abul Azam is in custody, a cheer goes up at state police headquarters from the task force. Everybody's high-fiving everybody else. There was no violence whatsoever. There was no attempt to not cooperate. Abul Azam went very quietly in the end. The relief is overwhelming, but the work for the investigators is far from over. To ensure his conviction, prosecutors need ironclad evidence. Search warrants are executed on his truck and residence. The most damning evidence almost left the country with him. His luggage didn't show up in Atlanta, and in fact had been left behind by the airlines in Louisville, Kentucky. We were able to find a pair of blue jeans, 
and the blue jeans had some blood. It was the blood of Arnold Miner. Arnold Miner, the unfortunate stabbing victim in Flint, Michigan, on August 2nd, becomes the key case in prosecuting Elias Abulazan. In the summer of 2012, Elias Abulazan is charged with the murder of Arnold Miner. Evidence from his other alleged attacks is used to support the prosecution's case. We were able to show the jury a lot of the other stabbings and present some of the surviving victims. And those surviving victims actually identified Elias Abulazam as their attacker. When I looked at him, it was kind of like, I know you wish you would have killed me now. You see you messed up. <laughs> there ain't no getting out of this one. The Flint serial slasher refused to confess to his crimes. His motives for attacking these victims remain a mystery. On June 25th, 2012, Elias Abulazan was found guilty on all counts and sentenced to life in prison. When the verdict came back on him of being guilty of first degree premeditated murder, that means in Michigan that he will spend the rest of his life in prison. That's the strongest sentence that we have here in the state of Michigan. We don't have the death penalty. Never, ever, ever again will this person inflict the type of pain and suffering on not only families, but communities as well. He's never going to see the outside of you. He's done. The slasher's reign of terror is over, but the pain lingers for his victims and their families. In his difficult journey of recovery, Etwan Wilson has been inspired by the same person who gave him a reason to live on that terrible night, his son. So it's beautiful being able to, you know, teach him things I want to teach him and watch him grow, and have fun, see him smile, play around. That's, that's a good feeling. I'm gonna still be who I am, regardless. He might have took, you know, my body, but he didn't take my spirit, my soul.